Integrating facts into writing using mentor text, a learning lab with Liz Fox. The lab will take place on Tuesday, April 10th and offer two options for observation. The first option is from 1231 to 118 and the second option is from 122 to 209. The debrief will take place from 315 to 415. The lab will focus on three questions. How can using mentor text support students through the process of integrating information into their own writing? How can mentor text help students understand structure or techniques used in academic writing? How can the understanding of mentor text improve students' own writing? Hi, my name is Liz Fox and I teach English at Decor High School and I'm a collaborative teacher. And I want to tell you about a learning lab that's coming up in a couple weeks and I'd love to have you join me if you're interested. My students have been engaged in mentor text up to this point in the lesson. I sometimes use mentor text to encourage students to study and to imitate what other authors are doing with their own writing. Sometimes we look at a model in its entirety and try to get a sense of the tone or maybe the message. But for this particular lesson, we're going to narrow it down to a specific focus uh, so that we can better guide the students as they're uh, working on their research. They've been researching topics about America in the 1920s. These are juniors. They're energetic. They've learned a lot about history. And now we're incorporating what they've learned with their specific topics to their research. Using a framework described in Writing with Mentors, I'm going to explore with students how other authors incorporate the information and then have the students consider and imitate these skills. Mentor text can be used for any style of writing in any content area. The students have been collecting lots of notes and then they will have created an outline of those notes. They've already asked me, how do we incorporate these notes into our writing? I will be offering a mini lesson on how to use mentor text to provide insight into how to successfully incorporate facts and quotes into the student's own writing. They will ask these questions about the mentor text. What do you notice about the type of information? Where does it fit in the paragraph? How is it incorporated into the writing? Based on what I've noticed, how can I practice this with my own writing? What in the text might enhance my own writing? We will discuss what the author is doing, how effective that is, and how students can use these strategies in their own writing. They may even be able to use a mentor text to help a classmate during peer review times. If you visit my lab, you'll be looking for the student's ability to notice and appreciate the choices that an author makes, and also the student's understanding about how to apply these choices to their own writing. Once you've seen enough about how the students are working with the mentor text, you will be free to leave. Thanks for considering and hope to see you. The following norms have been established for the lab. Maintain a positive attitude and respect for the lab host. Avoid being a distraction in the classroom. Do not talk to students or other teachers during the observation. Please save conversations so all can hear and participate. Stay close to the action so you can see and hear what students are doing as learners. Record detailed notes that are aligned with the observation to use during the debriefing session. Prior to the Learning Lab, the facilitator will provide you with the Learning Lab Protocol, which outlines the structure of the lab. Included in the protocol is a note-taking tool that includes the focus questions and the look-fors. During the observation, you are encouraged to take your notes here. It also includes a space for notes to use during the debriefing session. Learning labs are a way of getting better together and creating a culture of collaborative learning. We're excited that you're joining us for this lab. So what I want to do today is continue this idea of how we can learn from the way other people have taken their materials and put it into their writing, okay? So I want to start by just a refresher of the important things that we talked about yesterday. The idea first that by using other people's works but keeping our own voice, that we are in fact keeping our paper to be distinctly our own, okay? Also, we talked yesterday about that we're going to use those source materials to support our own position, not to 
give away that power and say, here's what someone else thinks. And I think that way too. It's more like, this is this is how I feel, and I have these other voices that are going to help me with that. Okay. And then the last thing we talked about that was important here, you're demonstrating you have control over your material. You are making it more readable by taking these experts in. Okay. So yesterday we took a look at a couple mentor texts. And what did we decide the definition of a mentor is? What did we say? What does a mentor do for us? You guys were eighth grade mentors to fifth graders, right? What did we say that that was? Someone who's kind of a role model. Role model. Yes. A guide. A guide. Okay. What else? Creating a path. path. Setting us on the right path, giving us a little bit of guidance along the way. If you have not numbered these, you need to do so now. Did you all number this one one? Have you done that already? So if you didn't do that, you were here yesterday. This one is number one. We number this one too. We're going to be referring to these throughout the rest of this week and perhaps maybe even a little bit next week. So whether you're working on your own writing or you're helping someone else, you may say, remember in that document number four where they had that block quote and they used the author's name beforehand, that'll give us just more of a point of reference if we actually number them. Okay? <clears throat> Very briefly for Anthony and anyone else who may be um, wasn't here, just to kind of get ourselves thinking back of, of this concept. Let's go to number one. And this was Tessa's, this is a paragraph about integration. And there's a couple smaller things, but there are some bigger things that we talked about too, and a couple things I want to mention to you that other classes have also talked about. What are the takeaways from this first mentor text? This is a review from yesterday. Okay, so the quotes in the middle, we're not starting with the quote, we're not ending with the quote, okay? That's what else? I was going to say that they analyze the quote. Um, so there's there's some analysis. It isn't, you're not just dropping that quote in there and asking the reader to try to figure out why did this person put this here, okay? Again, you're using other people's words to project your own voice. It's not like you're giving up that power, okay? What else did we realize was important about this? as a mentor text, something that we might be able to take something from this and, and use in our own writing. Um, the proper citation formatting. Okay. So something as simple as the proper citation formatting. Okay. If you don't do that correctly, not just in this class but beyond, it automatically drops the level of integrity of your paper. And so anyone who's going to read this, there may be people who read your papers in college who don't even know who you are, depending on where you go to school or you know who's reading your papers. And you want to have all those little minutia correct so that the rest of the paper seems um, a little more elevated. So with that in mind, um, what is the correct citation? What did, what did um, like the last name of the first part of the biography with just the number, the page. And okay. period outside of the process. So let's go to our mentor text number two to have us uh, learn a little bit more about that. Just a reminder of that. Okay. This may not have the quality as the first one. I know many of you guys were kind of shocked by how many citations were actually there. And Mrs. Butler and I talked about that. And when you read more academic work, oftentimes you will see that. There's one of these that perhaps we could consider common knowledge, and maybe we didn't need to have it in there. Does anybody want to take a stab at it? What do you think, Christian? Uh, Fraser tool for the part that goes before the act. So we talked about that a little bit. Why is it important that we actually do have to keep that Fraser tool for? Why is that necessary for that? I'm glad you brought this up, actually. What does this indicate? In Oklahoma, storms blew away topsoil. What does the Fraser 204 indicate? That's where they got the information. That's where they got the information. That's the whole point 
of citing the sources. So this lesson actually has two layers. The one layer is how can I take this stuff and create it into my own writing so that it's smooth and it makes sense and it empowers me and it makes the writing better. But we're also then talking about just sort of the ins and outs of parenthetical documentation. Second hour assures me they already know this. Spent two weeks in first going over this. And you've done it in other classes. So I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I do think it's worth a reminder, right? And just to have, just to see what it looks like can be important. Okay. I have a ton of cookbooks in my kitchen. Most of them have pictures. Because I want to see what it looks like. Right? Ooh, that looks good. I'm going to try that. That's what this is all about. Ooh, that looks good. I think I might try that with my own writing. So we actually have to keep the Fraser tool for because that's where this author got that information. But what can we maybe do with this concept? What's different about this parenthetical documentation compared to um, some of the other ones? Where do we find it? It's not at the end, right? It's not right there in the middle. So is that something you could maybe do in your own writing? You could certainly do that. Okay. What are these circles here with the period? What is that our reminder of? Period's go after me. The period has to go after the parenthetical documentation. Why? I talked a little bit about this yesterday, I guess. They would be so they wouldn't think the parenthetical documentation documentation goes with the Next coming sentence. Right, it tells us where it belongs. If you put the period at the end of the sentence, which of course is what you've been taught all of your life, okay, and then you have this parenthetical documentation just kind of swimming around, where is it supposed to go, okay? So you take that period, you don't want to have two periods, you don't need that. If you take that period that's supposed to be at the end of the sentence and you put it over here, then all of a sudden we know that that documentation goes with that sentence, okay? Watch for a change in that rule in our next two mentor texts for today. Okay. If you don't have an author, again, this is pretty simple stuff. Learned it already. We're just quickly going over it. If you don't have an author, what do you put in parentheses? Whatever is first in the work cited. Okay. So I'm going to steal Gus's for a second. going to use Babbitt, Cannon, Jazz, and Black and White. Okay. If I see that he has used where the dark and light tells me, I'm going to think, hmm, this is what should really be there. Okay. The, and the reason for the hanging indent, of course, is that as I'm looking through, I'll be able to more easily see, oh, that's where that came from. Is there a different way that I can say that, or does that make sense to you as far as why you pick what comes first? Because I've been teaching this for 30 years, sometimes twice a year. So we're talking at least 60 times, plus how many classes. I always get a couple of kids who just go rogue and think they can put whatever they want. I'll look at the work site and I'm like, where did, oh, there it is, like, you know, third line down. Just don't do that. This is a case where you have to follow the rules. You don't get to make them up, okay? Something as simple as that, just good to remember. Anything else you want to talk about before we dig into a couple new ones? Anything more that you have written down that you think is valuable to teach Anthony because he wasn't here or just in general remind yourself? Anything from one or two? All right, let's dig into a couple more. If you don't have a highlighter, there's some up here. We're going to make this longer one, number three.
questions that we think are going to be valuable for you as you continue this process. Okay. What do you notice about the type of information? Where does it fit in the paragraph? How was it incorporated into the writing? Based on what I've noticed, how can I practice this with my own writing? What in the text might enhance my own writing? So take a couple minutes, read through. It's a little bit longer, but it has a double purpose because it also explains why we don't use Wikipedia. So it's, a, it's good as a mentor text, but also the content is valuable as well. Okay, so do that right away. Tell them you're already there. Good. When you and your seat partner are ready, turn and talk about some things that you've discovered and we'll share out. You know, I suspect that they have, you know, another way to come up with really one problem so, there, and they explain it in an example of what people are saying. Um, it's not as crowded, right? Yeah, I think because they cited it differently. Mm -hmm. According to mm -hmm. just about you know, they actually wrote I, it I, in. Like, yeah. 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 But then, I would think that this would have to go with all of this because there wasn't a uh, parenthetical citation before, and this is obviously like uh, this sort. This information right here isn't. It was only thought because it's talking about somebody else. Master uh, Timothy. So is this quote from this quote's from Lanier, but is it just from his book? What do you got? What did you notice about this one? that is going to help inform um, our own writing, Natalie. Like, as Rona Simpson says, I didn't hear that twice, but as Rona like, said out, it's like, according to Lanier. So he's like, he already gives the author credit, so that in his citation, he doesn't put the author credit. Right. Some people do that double duty. They, they list the author in the sentence, and then they list it again in the parenthetical documentation. You don't have to do that. Okay. Now, we don't have a works cited for this, but if we did, we would see this guy's name on the works cited. Okay. Why do you think that he mentioned the author? Does he give any information about the author that lends credibility to that writer? Emma saying yes. What does he say? I'm just going to be talking about just giving some background on him to show how he's researched that topic and Exactly. Did you hear how she said that? Mm -hmm. Giving some background on that author. Okay. This author is a computer scientist and a pioneer of virtual reality. He's got some of that logos that we've talked about, right? He's got that credibility. It's not as valid to just say according to Miller because we don't know who Miller is, right? If we go to the back of your paper and we look at your work cited page, we'll see that it's Miller. But for all intents and purposes, is that really powerful? You're kind of giving this person more credibility than your own voice. So use this if you have information about this uh, particular author that would be helpful. Some people, frankly, just give the title of the, um, of the article, or in here it's a book, You Are Not a Gadget. Okay, good. What else do you notice about this that could be helpful 
when you start your own draft? Um, they provided like that example right before the last sentence, which really clarified that last sentence. You know, it's sort of talking about their overall point, but they just gave an example that would make it much easier to understand. This one here? Yes. Okay. Why is that indented like that? Okay, so it is a long quote, and I will admit that I made some adjustments to the margin so I could fit it all in there, and in doing so, this, this is sort of an example of what not to do. When you have, in MLA, if you go over that fourth line into the fifth line, that's when you indent. In a different form, you do something differently, but I'm not going to give words to that because I don't want to confuse you. But what we're doing right now is MLA, so you're typing along, and all of a sudden your quote gets to that fifth line, you have to go back and indent it. So um, let's not count the lines. But what else do you notice? And I think it's a really good example. You have all these people who say the sky is green. You have one people who says that it's blue. But Wikipedia is still going to say, we're going to keep with that mob mentality. I mean, we've got a lot of people who are saying that it's green, so we're going to make sure that to keep it green. That's a little scary, isn't it? Okay. Let's listen to the people who know. What else about the fact that it's blocked? What else do you notice? There's no quotes, but it's a quote. So why isn't there any quotes? But he says that he, this guy recounted the experience, including a telling comment. So he's actually quoting a comment. So it is a quote, but by the mere fact that it's already indented, that's MLA style of saying, we already know that it's a quote because you've indented it. This is a block quote. If you hadn't indented it, then you'd have to have quotation marks. So that's kind of another one of those repetitive things that you want to avoid. If you go, and again, we talked yesterday, you want to avoid super long quotes, but if you have one that you just have to use, and it goes into that fifth line, you're going to be indented all, and then you're going to get rid of the quotation marks because the indent, indentation already says this is a quote. What else do you notice about that quote? Anything else? So how is it documented? We know that it's a quote because it's indented. So you're not going to indent paraphrases. That's your own words. Those aren't indented. But how do, what's the documentation right here? What do we got? Who's the author? Who's quoting this? You're mouthing it. You can say it out loud. It's hard without the work cited. I know. I just couldn't find the work cited. Go ahead, son. Yeah. So this is the author. All right. What would we normally see at the end of a documentation that we don't, that like we see here, but not here? Page number, right? Okay. This is from an online source. It doesn't need a page number. It would. Do you want to do a sneak peek and see what that looks like? Let's flip over to number four. We didn't have, we didn't even number this yet, but there's that page number. Okay. So let's go back to three. And see if there's anything more we want to talk about here. Let's go ahead. Oh, uh, so when they cite like a source neutral point of view, is that referring to uh, what measure? Mr. Cruz is accounting or really recounting. Good question. What did you guys see in the back about that? What is neutral point of view? Somebody. What did you say it was, Les? Well, I'm just, is, is this referring to like um, the text above the quotation? It's actually it's a different text. Is this is a this is a citation that doesn't have an author. So it would be a article from magazine or something online because there's no um, page number. So that's when you're okay. going to that one. So second. this would be, I'm going to go back to yours. So Gus, when you 
are going to refer to jazz in black and white. You don't have an author for that. So that's what's going to go as your citation. The period won't be there because the period will be after, but you'll still have the quotes around there. So that's what this is here. That's where he got this. Wikipedia's policy is to present all views, even incorrect ones, provided they are published in a reliable source. So he got that information. That's their policy. He got that from that article. So that's the documentation there. Okay. If I can, if I can drum up the work cited for this, I will get that to you guys, and that might be helpful for some of that. What else do you want to talk about in terms of this number three, our third one? Anything style, stylistically that you like? I noticed that these guys were focused on the content. That even though we're trying to figure out what the author's choices are, the content comes shining through, which I think to me is a nod to the success of the author. He's able to um, create it in such a way that we can't help but go, wow, really? Celebrating the ideal of the intellectual mob rule? Okay. Just because all these people say it, all of a sudden it becomes true. So what stylistic choices were made that help us to see, the, to see this clearly? Anything that you guys talked about or noticed? Provides like more than one source of evidence. Okay. But we've talked about someone else's. And we've talked about that with that little one too, with the topsoil and all of that. Okay, that it gets a little bit. Um, there's, there's some questioning if all of your citation for a section of your paper is going to be from the same source, because then you're almost doing a little mini article review of that source. And you're losing your own power and you're giving it to that article's author. Right? Look what this author says. And then he said this. And then he said this. And then he said this. Wow, this author's great. Right? You, this is your paper, your thoughts, your central question, your thesis. You're going to use these other people to help you prove. And that's what this person did, right? We do have this Jaren guy twice. He uses it here. And then they very, I think, very smoothly says again, according to him, we, we already have established who he is. According to him, okay, both of these were found on the same page. Okay. And we already know it's a book because you can list the book. You don't have to list the book, but if you feel like that will help your paper and help your point, you absolutely have the right to do that. But you don't have to do it to sort of let the uh, reader, no, this is where I got it from because that's what your work cited page is for. Okay? So we have this guy, and then we have this person, and then we have a third article. All within one paragraph, we have three different people. So thank you for putting that out. I think that's important. Okay? Read the topic sentence, please. Read that first sentence. Does that establish pretty firmly what the rest of that paragraph is going to be about? Okay. That is something I really want you to attend to when you start your own drafts. That's why I was so picky with your outlines and making sure that how you framed that information made sense. Because like we talked about, and you have this in Canvas, you should be able to take your outline and turn it right into your paper. You guys remember this? And the student who wrote this gave me permission to share it with you. Okay? So if you can, if it makes sense in your outline, it's going to make sense in your draft. All right? Do you see enough mixture of the author's own voice and then help from other people? Okay? So that's something I think you consider. Any last thoughts on three? before we go to four, because then we're going to have you try that with your own um, facts, your own writing. Last call for three. Anybody have anything else they want to mention? As an aside, would it have been easier if you had
we were excited for that. It would be easier to be able to, okay. I will dig through and see if I can find that. Okay, let's try number four. Then the first thing we're going to do, if we haven't done it already, is call it number four. So that as we are referencing this, whether it's with our own writing or with others, this one I did have that we're excited. This came from OWL, which is the Online Writing Lab of the University. Something that um, you will use probably all of your academic career. Okay? Does a really good job of keeping things updated because uh, things keep changing. So, this is from there. It is about um, farming. Take a couple minutes and read through. A couple new things, one in particular. Read through, make some marks, and then talk to your seat partner and partners about it. Which was how it's If it's a book, then you probably get a last name and yeah. 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 so yeah. I don't know if this came from I think we're ready to kind of talk about this as a group, and I'm liking a lot of what I've heard so far because I think that there's some learning to this in a positive way, but also maybe a little bit of what not to do, especially with, with the work that you've done so far and some of the other um, texts that we've taken a look at. So I'm going to open it up to anything. What would you like to talk about? Yes. That is the biggest reason why I use this, so I'm glad that you noticed that first. This looks like a typo based on our new learning. It looks like something that would that a normal person would do, right? Because what do you do at the end of a sentence? You put a period at the end of the sentence, okay? But we've just learned that the period doesn't go at the end of the sentence. The period goes after the citation. So what's going on with this? Because here, the period is after, okay? So again, this is kind of the secondary how to do it, but we're also going to look at some of the quality of the style choices to see how that makes a difference. Any thoughts as to why MLA makes that as a rule? Yeah. Well, because it's an indented quote. It's an indented quote. So those are special rules. So because it's already indented, we know that that parenthetical documentation belongs to that indented quote, right? There aren't any words on this other side where it could possibly belong to. Okay, does that make sense? And then we also don't have quotation marks. Again, because it's an indented block. Right? But I'm going to be honest with you here. The first time I saw this in a student's paper, I thought the student was wrong. And I called her on it, and then she showed me in the book, well, this is what it looks like in the book. So, you know, back in the day, so I appreciate learning from my students. 
So there are times when it might look like it's wrong. You need to check with me, check with OWL, check with any other um, documentation that we have anywhere to just see if it's right. Okay? Stylistically, what do you, got? What do you think? Right. Yeah. And that's what these guys were, were concerned about as well. Okay. So he's hoping that agriculture will be taught at the school. And part of that hope was realized when Michigan finally did establish that. And this author found that out from this person on that page. Okay? Yes? Um, I thought that that connection between them, you know, was actually really strong, but the bigger problem was like no analysis of a quote from the 1800s. I think that was poorly done. No analysis. And it's, but we, we learned the other day, especially if you have a longer quote, those almost <coughs> beg for some reason as to why, why did you give up your own voice and let this other person talk for so long in your paper? You need to step in and go, here's why I did that. I like, Without using I like that they were able to say that what Nicholson was hoping came true. Like, I think that's good, but I okay. think it is confusing because there's not analysis for right. it. Okay. Yes? Aside from the fact that the 34 lines are a majority of the title of the book, I don't really like the fact that most of this paragraph is the source. Okay, so it's, it's quite long, right? Um, the author for this block quote is way up here. So what Haley's mentioning is a good point. So there's a, you know, to dump this whole book in there, maybe isn't necessary. Maybe you could use your own words and say a book about making sure that farmers have a chance to be educated and to list that whole thing. There's a lot borrowed from other people and not as much of the author's own writing. something that you guys already learned can be problematic. I did want to show you that. And <coughs> as the other one used the title of the book if you wanted to. Were you able to pretty easily clear up that and how that goes with that? that work? Okay. Any last thoughts about mentor text number So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take all four of them, put them on your desk, and I want you to write in the bottom, what is your personal takeaway for each one? Number one, I'm going to, I learned most about blank. Okay. What's the one thing that you're like, yep, this is a takeaway for my own writing for number one. Number two, same thing, number three and number four. Once you finish with that, if there's anything new that comes up, by all means, share with me. Otherwise, in the five minutes that we have left, we can maybe start to look at how we're going to apply it to our own writing. <coughs> so as you're thinking about these venture texts, and you're writing down for each one, what's the best takeaway for you? What might I be able to use in my own writing? If something new comes up, by, by all means, share so we can learn from it, please. Like, one of the 
Ultimately, we hope to give you some time to write. If you had so many good things that you wanted to know, we didn't give a chance to that. Just looking through the rest of the week, Wednesday and Thursday are for sure draft days. Friday is going to be the beginning of peer editing, if that's something that you choose to do. Also, if you guys are interested in any kind of ACT prep, those of you that are braving the ACT on Saturday morning, let me know. I know we've done some work with the English. If you want to do something with the reading, let me know. Or if you want extra te tests, let me know that as well. Okay. Monday will for sure be one more day for this paper, and then we need to decide if we're going to start Gatsby on Tuesday or on Wednesday. I'm kind of itching to get started on this. Um, I don't want to give you time that you don't need, but I also want to make sure to give you time that you might need. Okay? So for sure, drafting and peer editing through Monday, and then we'll kind of check in with each other and see from there. Yeah? I just have a question. Let's so you indent it only if it's like a direct quote from the source or whatever. It goes over the fifth line. Okay. Yep? Yeah? Otherwise, you just use regular quotation marks. So in the two and a half minutes we have left, best thing about number one, anybody? Best thing about number one? What'd you write down in your papers? Anybody? Yes. Use more, Use more than one source. Great. Best thing about number two. Anybody? Number two. What do you have in your papers? What'd you write? Yes. How do you have to cite anything new you learned? Cite anything new. Okay. Otherwise, it's plagiarism. You can't pretend that it's your own information if you got it from someone else. Very good. Best thing about number three. Yes. How would they talk about their information with a source back to it? Like, say, like, according to. Right. So if you establish who that author is, you can say according to. And we have good information on um, signal phrases on this handout um, that Mrs. Butler created a couple years ago. Okay? So I'll make extra copies for those of you who don't have that. And finally, the best thing about number four, even if it says what not to do, anybody? Number four. This year, if you're going to indent a quote, and it's a, if it's a book, and you can have a page number, make sure that you have a period before the parenthetical page number. Well, thank you for joining us today. I know many of you have been through the, the protocol for the learning lab, but for those who haven't, we will go through four rounds. And the first round will focus on student evidence, just what you noticed uh, during the observation period, uh, specifically in regards to the look fors and the focus questions. In round two, we'll go through some implications for um, instruction. And in round three, we'll hear a little bit of response from Ms. And in round four, we'll just explore next <coughs> steps about how you could possibly apply what you saw in the lab today in your own instruction. We'll do a whip around. So um, as when you have something to offer, we'll just quickly go around the circle. And then if you have um, 
said all that you have in your notes, feel free to skip and we'll just go that route until everyone's done. Okay. <clears throat> so for round one, what specific evidence did you see or hear regarding the focus questions and look for? Jen, can we go ahead and start sure. around you? Um, I saw that everyone had all the materials they needed and that wasn't an issue to get the lesson going. I saw quite engaged students throughout the lesson. I saw students citing uh, specific parts of the metric texts for uh, their ideas. I heard a student say it's good to have a bad example because it shows that they're able to analyze and learn. I was in a different class group than you guys, but I, I just heard amazingly deep thoughts that even a couple things that I hadn't picked up on that I was really impressed with what they had to say. I heard from the teacher that Canvas is being utilized in class. Uh, I noticed the analogy that you used about cookbooks, the importance of imagery and, and, and um, having a picture in your head, and I think I really appreciate it. I noticed uh, uh, you circulating around the classroom, uh, checking in with groups of students during the periodic throughout the, the time. Uh, I liked how the students use their own words to replace mentor. Um, and so they defined it as a role model. I liked that. They set a guide, uh, created a path. I liked how they came up with their own definition of what like a mentor. I saw the students really engaged, taking notes, highlighting, uh, making comments individually before you got them together. They were really good thinking. To go off that, I saw a lot of tools, lots of different colored highlighters and pens, like to separate the different lessons that you've taught and the different um, things that they were looking for. I saw you use a document camera effectively, and I also saw you asked them, is there a different way that I can I saw a period of time early in the lesson where you sort of recaptured the. Eric Dutcher, if you're in the building, please see Mr. Condon. Thanks. We recaptured the, the learning that had happened earlier. I heard you consistently referring to the students thinking about their own writing and how they can use their learning when it is time for them to write. Um, I saw how you let some of the students explain. We had one in particular who had a really great explanation and you just kind of let her take off and explain it. I heard you give a great example of a time where you were wrong when you called the student on, um, on something <laughs> that they weren't really wrong on. And I think that that was great for the students to see that Everybody makes mistakes, and that's how you learn. Uh, I noticed your color-coded outline and draft. I really love that color -coded. I saw at the end of the lesson a, uh, that you had asked them to uh, to take have, to basically declare a personal takeaway for each mentor. And I I just saw the part about talking about Wikipedia. You use an example, but remind them not to use that as a, you know, a base, basis for notes. I heard you talk about OWL or OWL and how you emphasize that that is a tool that they will use for the rest of their academic career and why. I noticed your posters in the back of the room and I made me wonder if you had done that first as an intro to the school during different classes. Yes. I noticed um, students, some students uh, groups were talking anima animatedly with each other and others were less engaged with each other. I'm not sure what the contact with each other. Coming from a third grade teacher, it was, it was neat to see you say, okay, get with your seat partner, talk and share out, just seeing how that same idea still applies to juniors in high school, right? Turn and talk, like, discuss what you read. You kind of sort of human nature, you know, you want to talk about what you're learning. 
I noticed when you when you noticed that there were some students who weren't as engaged that you went over there and tried to engage them to help them to have a place to start. One last thing is I noticed you began the last lesson talking about purpose and how um, it's great to find research, but to make sure to keep your to keep your own words and to use the power kind of the power of your words to make it your own paper. Okay. So, uh, trying to do a quick summary here of the things that you saw. A lot of the comments seemed um, to focus on instructional moves in the classroom, talking about beginning the lesson with purpose, uh, moving around the classroom to engage students, uh, recapturing earlier learning, continually referring to students' own writing and how they were going to apply what they were seeing to the writing. Uh, another category that you guys uh, focused on were some of the tools used. So some of the examples on the teacher end as far as the outline and the, the highlighted draft, the document camera, but then also how the students were using their own tools to, to help go through that learning process of highlighting and annotating on the, on the paragraphs. Uh, another focus area of your comments were, was just on the student engagement and the quality of, of comments that students were we're offering during the, the lesson and then kind of a mix of um, of students engagement and interaction with each other throughout the class so that takes us to uh, round two uh, during this round we will uh, based, based on your observations, talk about the broader implications for all students and instruction in general, not just in Liz's classroom, but just um, in all of your classrooms, and what this means for your teaching and learning. Jen, do you want to start? Sure. Yep. Um, based on the idea of using somebody else's research, I think it was very helpful for me to do what's called genius hour at the elementary level. Um, maybe middle school does it too, I'm not sure. Um, and I just kept seeing that all throughout your lesson, just different ideas, quotes in the middle, for instance. Uh, also, one of the literacy units that I helped um, design is kind of like Genius Hour, so it's you know based all on informational reports and research. And so it was very helpful to see how you, you, how you used the mentor text or how you taught students to use the mentor text. But I think more importantly, how your end goal is that, in the end, it's theirs. It's their work. Um, I really like the way you emphasize, and the students did too, come up with this uh, as a comment, the importance of their own analysis in there and reading that in the lecture of the text. Um, I, I, I'm interested to see their, you know, I'd be interested to see their papers to see how well they do that next. Um. Because I was here and saw the way you introduced, I like uh, uh, these uh, questions sort of at the beginning of each mentor, uh, ask them to focus on specific things. Um, I think uh, I'm always never sure how to, to do this part. <laughs> um, uh, but I'm going to say I think I would use those kinds of questions in my work. Right? Seems like, can we talk about that part? I think that's just fine. I, okay. I should have I should have prefaced that that with round two and three. A lot of times during round two, there's questions, um, so we can just go ahead if you want to okay. jump in, Liz, and talk a little bit about the questions for those students. At the very end of the class period, we had them write at the bottom of their mentor text. So. And during the entire class period, I went through their conversations. I could tell that some of them were already looking ahead to their own writing. And so I, I wrote down, um, like, it was it was really neat to see them developing ideas. I mean, you couldn't really see it. I mean, you could, it was happening. And through their conversations that it would be really neat to see their writing afterwards. But that, that looking ahead to 
their own writing and um, having good and bad examples to really kind of motivate. I feel like it was motivating to them using the measure test. Um, what I saw is something that that we've talked about, the importance of stretching this beyond just research paper in English. And I think that you know, we've worked hard on that, especially with the juniors also doing the, a lot of history stuff. But you, however you did it, you made it, you made it seem broader. It, it wasn't just isolated in here. So whatever, the, I can't remember your exact wording or you know, what it was that you said, but that was, that, that's the important thing to not have them say, not have them thinking it, it's just in here. They're gonna use it all the time. Based on what I heard you say about using several people to help you prove something, I think that I might not be so lenient on Genius Hour on the topics kids pick. I've really always been pretty lenient and, you know, an example would be um, Northern Pike. Well, there just really aren't a lot of books or literature on Northern Pike and I, in the past, I've uh, before today have um, settled on one or two pieces and now I see the importance of many mentor texts and how having just one can make it just basically analyze someone else's work. You're just really kind of giving credit to someone else instead of making it your own. And I, I mean I can just see their writing in my in my head right now of how that's just facts facts, 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 instead of them actually putting it into words what they really learned about the Northern Pike or whatever the topic is. Well, I had a couple of questions that I that I think about it afterwards. One is, um, you showed Gus's bibliography and I wondered if the students, I, you know, I saw that they already have outline. I wondered if they also do a bibliography and outline before they start writing mm -hmm. or if so they do. And then, um, that's interesting that they already have that that they can already already know. So that's, and then when they do their peer editing, I'm wondering how you do that and if they have a, a different seat buddy that they do that with, or do they get to choose their peer editors? I'm interested in how you do that with the school. No, can I answer that? Yes, can I answer that? please do. Uh, they will um, choose their own. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple students who do not like to peer edit, and at this level, they're almost seniors. That's not what they want to do. That's fine. Some um, would rather they just trust themselves, and they don't want to take that time to help someone else. And they would rather be working with their own work. But I do have. Um, I can. I'll share it with you. I have a real simple first glance. You know, how do the citations look? Are there topic sentences? Things like that. But then I also have um, another sheet that goes in a little bit deeper. You understand what the author is trying to prove. The reason why they have their work side of page already printed out is number one, Shannon Horton looks through all of those and, and gives them um, feedback. And then I'll have them highlight that first thing on the work side so that they know that's what goes in parentheses. Because otherwise they go rogue and they do their own thing. So um, they had to do five sources and I, I looked at each one as it came in. So source number one was due on a certain day and I, I checked and there were a couple times I could head them right off and say, nope, that's not, you can't use that. One of them was Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, no, you can't use that, find something else. So um, that's really should be just a collection of the solid sources that Shannon helped them find and I tried to, you know, redirect them if they were going somewhere they shouldn't. So I had a, a question too um, about like where this is in terms of the instructional flow. Um, have they had an opportunity to do some writing of their own on this? Um, and I, I guess the question comes from this is an analytical task and it's situated, is it situated in after they played with trying to do it and now they're going to analyze and then they're going to do it again or is it a like earlier, before they've done their writing, and then they're going to apply it. You see what I'm saying? I do, and I yeah, I, 
when I teach this process in composition, they do have to write a paragraph and then that extends to a one pager where I'm checking in with them. Um, part of what we do in the in the junior curriculum is just to give them the confidence of taking something as big as for them a four to six page paper document in MLA and um, go through the steps so they start with. Um, Shannon's really taught me to just back up and give them time to read and think and think and read. Their their guiding question. And I, I did some work create helping them create some decent essential questions. Then their thesis statement isn't due until after their third of the fifth source. So they're really still refining and defining what they want to say. And so there's there's work here, but it's not necessarily. And, and we I talk to them every day, you know, constantly. Um, what do you think about this? And is this going to work? And then um, looking at their outlines pretty carefully too, so that I can say, okay, this has been on you up to this point, but now you're kind of handing it off to a reader. Will I be able to understand the order in which you're planning on giving this information? So, but we will spend the rest of this week drafting um, because I think they still do need that guidance. Mm -hmm. maybe. And so on Friday, they have to have at least a page or two for some semblance of peer editing or at least they've got they they stepped into that part of the process. But I, I'm hoping that what we did yesterday today will make will arm them with the, what they need to be more successful with it. And so like I don't know how to put this stuff in here now here are some models for that. Right. So So that kind of goes into what I was thinking. Um, so you know we today really showed me or just reminded me of how important modeling is. Because I think it would be so easy for them to want to just write. Can I just write? I'm ready to write. Mm -hmm. And um, how easy it would be to just skip over this and let them write. But you're using these mentor texts and going through examples and having them highlight, make connections. It's really setting them up for success with their writing. So it's, I also have two seconds in 11th grade, so we're doing exactly the same thing right now. So it was just kind of fun to see where Liz was, we're a day behind her. But um, when I went back to my seventh hour class then, um, was, we're at the same point, they're, they're working on their, inner, or on their outlines and they're just getting ready to start writing. And a student said to me, I would have really liked to start my, out, my detailed outline and then stop and do more notes because I have some places now that I'm finding I'm still filling in. Have you ever done it that way? Like halfway through, stop and process? Um, they do start categorizing their notes as soon as they feel like they're ready to do that. Right. But I notice some kids will they'll have like 12 categories. Mm -hmm. It's not really necessary. I mean, you only have 50 notes all together. They do a skeletal outline first, where I just want to know their big section categories, mm -hmm. and then from there, and, and frankly, I, I don't know if I said it when you guys were in the room, but Wednesday and Thursday of this week can also be going back to the library and filling in those places where they're like, oh, I wanted to say this, and I guess I don't have enough yeah. um, support for that. Yeah. So, okay. but that's, but that's yeah. not, you know, that's, that's something to think about, is maybe they could start at least thinking about how they're going to put it together. And that was the only only one student out of all mine that said it, but he had a valid point, so I thought, I just didn't know what you thought about that. Well, I do, I mean, they embrace messy learning. Right. Um, they, it's not lineal. They right. know they're going to have to go back. Yeah. yeah. So. Maybe he's just going to want to ask. Maybe he's yeah. think of the same This thing. one would think that way. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, this may be very elementary question. Because I heard you say draft then edit, and I hear draft and edit again during the debrief. Does edit at this level mean like revision and edit? Is it like just a combined thing, or are they only editing looking for looking for citation errors and things like that, and not looking to improve the actual paper? Both. I mean, we, we you're right. So edit. So I should probably said revise. You know, revision. Although I do want them, and I, I do this with all of my writing um, classes. I do want them to, to 
maintain ownership of their writing. Because so often, even you know, a peer editor will say, I'm going to put a comment here or change that verb. It's like, it was really good the way it was, you know. And so just to, I'm trying to build confidence as well. Um, but yeah, we do things, so it's a combination of both. Yeah, probably makes a lot more sense at this level to just combine the two rather than keep them separate. I just want to make sure. Yeah. I don't think I have any questions. I guess my thought, uh, do you have, do you use mentors all the way through the process? This is mentors in a, in a citation sort of credibility manner. Do you have mentors for the larger structure? And, I mean, are you playing with that too? Of or? the research paper itself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I hesitate, I, when I was a young, naive teacher, uh -huh. I would fan out, look at all of these examples, and the next day, five of them would be gone, and the next day, another, uh, they probably uh, sold them, you know, for, yeah. you know, it's a lot right. of work sitting right there. Right, yeah. um, and so even with the, uh, the color-coded, yeah. I only have, like, the first page or two, because I kind of want mm -hmm. them um, I think some of them, um, that goes back to the confidence thing, they'll want to see what it looks like um, almost too much. And I want them to feel like they can craft their own thoughts and just use this sure. yes. documentation to help support that. So we do work with metric texts outside of the research process. This is the first time I've done it with integrating the facts. And that was just something that I knew I wanted to try. And the kids articulated that that's what they wanted help with, you know. Um, that's interesting, you came from that. Yeah. It did, actually. Mm -hmm. We had already started that, but they didn't know that. Yeah. But I had them do kind of a, you know, mid-process check, and quite a few were like, I don't know what to do with all these cards, you know, mm -hmm. what am I supposed to do with this yeah. stuff? Yeah. So, it's like, we'll get to that, I promise. Mm -hmm. people to support your work so that it's you are coming up with the ideas and you're not just basing it that off one off one source uh, something else was just the way that um, this lesson was focused that there were questions focusing the, the students on specific parts of the paragraph that the modeling um, that itself was was focusing on what students could be doing with their own writing and that they were looking at the mentor text but with the whole idea in their head that they were always looking for well then I could use this or I shouldn't do my writing like this either way for the good and bad examples and then a few of you talked about how this process itself can move beyond the, the research paper it makes sense in, in for other assignments and probably in other content areas as well. <clears throat> okay, I did think of it, and I don't know how to turn it into a question, but some something um, based on your emphasis on plagiarism, I find it so interesting that that, and I'm sure at the collegiate level and higher ed, it has to. It's interesting to me how for years we all just need to be reminded, and I think a lot of it has to do with technology and how accessible. Right words are to us that sounds so good and you're talking about the confidence like I'm not gonna make it sound that great you know just that whole piece of 
sometimes when I'm crafting an email to somebody, I'll look up like, oh, I wonder, maybe I'll use this word, and then I'll find like exactly what I wanted to say, but better. <laughs> you know, I mean, just I just find that so interesting. So I liked how you you still emphasize that. You know, you still bring that up. It came out pretty clearly when I we asked about the one that the documentation that was in the middle of the sentence, and then you know what was different about that. And someone said, "Well, you really oh, I know." I had asked what what could probably be deleted, and I was looking for the common knowledge, which would have been the Great Depression, and instead the kid talked about the documentation in the middle, and that was a good you know learning opportunity. No, you really can't delete that because of exactly what you're saying. You know, you need to um, you need to be able to cite where you got all of your information. You got it from somewhere. We need to know where it came from. Mm -hmm. So, and we do talk about that. I talk about um, the consequences of plagiarism at different levels and how easy it is yeah. to cut and paste. Right. So, all right. So that will take us to round three. So this is where we hear from Liz. Uh, a little bit about how her thinking has changed, future goals for instruction, how the student learning will be assessed. Before having Kylie walk me through some of the ideas in this book, Writing with Mentors, I did quickly show them not the, the wording part of it, but the documentation. So I showed them that same one with the top soil of the Great Depression, and I would say, See, this came from this source, and this came from that source. And um, it was really top down. You listened to me, and so I liked that I was asking the kids to be more engaged with the mentors. And also, takeaways for different people are going to be different. Instead of me telling them what they need to learn, having them dig out what they needed to learn. And so, in sixth hour, there were students who are quite bright who noticed almost immediately that in one of them, the vocabulary of the author very much matched the vocabulary of the quotes, and it was a very seamless transition. And in the other one, it was very different, and how jarring that was. And so I feel like allowing them to work individually and then in pairs is kind of a lazy way for me to differentiate, because the kids can get what they need by taking what they need. And then we also then learn all together when they share out with the whole group. So um, I do like Jen your idea though of possibly separating the revision from the editing. And I felt and I tried to explain that this was kind of a multi-layered lesson that we're learning about documentation, which to me is more of a reminder, but that it's also about what are all the ways that can infuse this information so that it's still your own and you're just using these other people to help explain whatever it is you're trying to explain or prove or whatever. And so I might make that two lessons. That one lesson might be simply just a reminder, here's how you document. Highlight all those first things and you were excited. Make sure that this is how you do it with the period. I didn't want to spend so much time on some of that minutia. Do you put quotes or do you not put quotes? Page number, do not put page number. Um, and maybe that should have been a lesson different from, okay, now let's look at the actual writing. Mm -hmm. and, and as you're drafting, you know, instead of trying to do both at once, it might have been better as separate lessons. How do you leave it together? Which right. Is really hard. Right. It's right. really a skill. Yeah. And so. a skill they need because look at yourself. You're not going through everybody's paper and revising and right. then going through everybody's paper and editing. You're right. doing it at the same time. Yeah. I do like, Steve, your idea of um, maybe a little bit more, I don't know if we can go so far as to call it metacognition, but having them stop and really think. And, and I mean, I, I do expect of my composition students, I can certainly ask these guys. Write it, write it, even half a page. Where are you with this? What are you learning? Where do you see yourself going with that? What do you, you know? And I, I do that in short bursts, but maybe to really get them doing more writing instead of all this gathering, organizing, and then finally getting to the writing. So, um, in terms of my next step, I am 
Carol, like you said, very excited to see more of the variety. I scrambled to find decent mentor tents. I have had, in my 15 years here at Decorah, many, many excellent students. But I noticed some of the things that these mentor texts were kind of modeling, I wasn't finding in my prior students' work. So I'm hoping to see, you know, whether it's mixing up um, the different places, even though I, I stress that to a certain extent, mixing up where they're giving the information or um, giving someone um, a nod within the text, you know, and here's this author, you did this, and then, you know, just the various ways to use the information. I, I'm, I'm really guessing that I'm going to see more of their own analysis and more of a variety of how they put this all together. So, and looking, and I think that'll be a good skill for them. And we've done some work with that already. I may or may not have mentioned. Um, I've had students say, "Now we can't start with a quote, right? And we can't end with a quote, right?" I and mean, so we've been building up to this, but I still think it's going to be valid to um, to see how well this modeling worked for them when they're doing their own writing. So. Do you have a question? I say you try. Oh, I'm. Uh, I'll no. It's, I do, but um, maybe. It's, okay. <laughs> so that takes us to round four, and during this book around, this is when you have a chance to share how you could foresee this um, having an impact in in your own classrooms with your own students and your own um, assignments and lessons. So. If you need a couple minutes to, to jot down some ideas, we can do that. Uh, and then if you're re or whenever you're ready, we can, we can jump into sharing how, how you foresee that you can maybe use something from the Learning Lab today. I can start. Uh, right now, we're actually, um, students have compared two books on the same author compared and contrasted two books and right now they're in the final stages of the writing process with their script so they're going to be typing this in once it's um, published on paper they're going to be then typing it in because we want to follow the writing process and still practice that typing it into an app on their ipad so they have a script to read while they do a green screen activity part of the script that i emphasize that I want the students to do is to add quotes from the book, not at the beginning, not at the end, and not even mention, even though the, a page or a cover of the book is behind them, not right away to mention what the book is, but sort of a hook mm -hmm. and to start telling a little bit about the plot, you know, maybe talk about a little bit about the exposition first, um, but a quote somewhere in the middle. And it got me thinking that last year when they did this unit for the first time, I never had them cite within the, the script. Granted, it's verbal when they do this in front of their peers, but I'm still looking at their published piece. And so I'm wondering, how do I do that? How do I, yeah, I don't know how what to expect from them with that. So that is, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, that progression of how we teach these skills through elementary through high school would be an interesting thing for us to put together as the LA people. Um, because we, we do genius hour, you know, eighth grade does ADHD, and you know, there is there is a progression that ha that is happening, but I'm not sure that we all know exactly when right. we're when we're doing what I think we in high school we do. And I know I talked to, to Miss Seaman and she focuses a lot on more of the work site page, you know, more of the references at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just started Genius Hour, what we call Genius Hour too, which is really a research project with a, with a thesis in seventh grade. And um, I do use mentor text from previous students. Um, but um, I think that maybe after we've seen what you do, maybe I'll do um, one step at a time with each, um, each with the mentor text. You know, just emphasize um, you know, each step along the way rather than showing them all the mentor text. Mm -hmm. Take a little to, to chunk, a, chunk yeah. it out a little bit. I'm assuming that they have an overview of what it might look like, right? right. Then to just, you know, and I don't really know. I mean, this is seventh grade. It, it, I'm not quite sure. I think 
exactly how fussy I should be with, with doing citations. You know, that's something that we, I think we kind of struggle with. I'm happy to let you do all of the particulars of it in high school because it is a little overwhelming in those numbers. Do they use neural terms? They must. Yeah. Then you get the bibliography down, but the in-text citations. Um, I was uh, I was intrigued by the, the the close reading is like an analytical task of the metro text, and um, it occurred to me I would like to do more of that. For the like, it's, you did it for this real specific purpose of, of looking at. Uh, I mean, for the larger purpose of developing credibility as a writer, but for the specific purpose of how do you integrate sources with your own voice and, and all of that. And it occurred to me that I would like to try that kind of close readings in a in a digital format where uh, students would maybe in small groups have the same document and annotate it. Um, uh, either with a Google tool or with a hypothesis or some other digital tool so that they could see their own thinking develop as they went along. And uh, I would be curious to see how that would change um, change the, the, I mean, yeah. I am starting a genius hour in seventh grade as well. So this entire lesson, my brain was just turning like, okay, I, I need to I need to get some mentor text. So my first question is, where where am I gonna find them? What where can I find some quality mentor texts that relate to this genius hour project that uh, like you said, I'm not sure if previous work from students is what I sh should be using. We struggled with that a little bit, you know, and we were able to find um, some that worked pretty well. Um, Kylie does have a document for you guys that does um, help with some of that, um, some of the ideas from the writing with the mentor. I think um, deciding your purpose first, and my purpose was integrating facts into the writing. But if you want maybe um, interesting intros, you know, then that might be a different way that you're going to mm -hmm. go about that. And that's where, really when I think of how much writing some creators have done about their research, I think this is one of the first times that they're really writing a paper. Mm -hmm. And so I liked what Carol said about even breaking it down with their intro first. That includes their thesis. And, and then you've got... We, we typically do like a five paragraph, where then they have three supporting details, which are their next three paragraphs in the conclusion. So really breaking it down, um, but finding mentor text for each of those to help them along. Because it is a really big step in their writing progression, this writing in seventh grade, which then prepares them for an HD. So how long is this process for you? Like when did you start? We started the research way back in March 14th. Okay. And um, Shannon had books in the library. And because we've been doing a 1920s project for a while, she keeps adding more. But she had books based on themes on the tables in the library. We have a student who's graduating a year early. And I told her on one of those days, I said, you know, when you go to Iowa, and if you do research, you're not going to walk into the library and they're going to be these magical piles of books. You know, so it's not good. Um, but just really wanting them to find a topic that would be interesting for them, and then providing them solid, valid sources so that they could write a paper with integrity. And um, a paper, like you said, they themselves would be credible by using credible sources. And so I can absolutely send me the calendar, but it's um, we try to shrink it a little bit because we have other things that we need to get done. Usually, I give them a day in between to hand in source cards, and I have to do one a day. So they have to do them during their study hall. And there's some online things as well, um, online sources. So it wasn't like they just had to do it during class. Mm -hmm. um, 
So they do have to have some print sources too. Um, we try to encourage that because there's so many decent ones there, mm -hmm. but when they go to college, oftentimes they won't, they won't need to do that. So we're kind of bridging that, how much are we trying to teach them to be high school students, but then how much are we trying to prepare them for beyond, and there's some really decent sources that are online. Oh yeah. So, so we don't insist on that anymore, we used to. but. So to ultimately answer your question about venture text, it depends on what you're wanting to do. If you're really looking at the in, you know, the, the in-text citation part of it, I think that's more difficult than if you were just to, you know, I've got lots and lots of anthologies. I think that's where Kyra found a couple of things. If you're just looking for how someone introduces a topic. So I think keeping it all in mind might be a little bit easier. And in, in, the, in the book, they they talk about approaching it in two ways. And one is looking for mentor texts that fit the genre of the exact assignment that you're hoping that they're writing. And the other is that skill-based method where, so you want to focus on how somebody offers their analysis, look at whatever you can find. They, they um, definitely push the idea of finding professional writers. Um, so if if you are looking at some sort of film critique that's you know in the New York Times, but somebody really offered a piece of evidence and analysis, you look at just that paragraph of that film critique. And even though it's not that type of writing you're looking for in the class, you're looking for that skill in the writing. Uh, so they they kind of encourage that you don't have to be limited to the exact format that you're looking for. But it's just fine to us. <laughs> well, I just wanted to add that it was it was good for me to I tend to tell in that show. And Liz is so good at making the students um, have ownership of their own discoveries. So that just you know, I told her I just made screencasts of everything that she talked about today and they're gonna start looking at them tomorrow. And that's fine. But it also, I think, makes more of an impact when they have to think discover some of those things. So too late for this group, but maybe next year I'll take a day like you're doing. <laughs> that, that, yeah, but that, that sticks, it's fun when they discover it. So, yeah. Something interesting that I learned, or I guess didn't know could happen and maybe should happen, um, from what I know of Genius Hour and the way we design the literacy unit that we're working on, or that we just got done with, actually, or uh, the informational report one that we just got done with, you had said think and read, read and think, and then pose your guiding question. And what we do at our level is we say, what do you want your topic to be and what's your essential question? Right off the bat. And I like the idea of not, and I think we do that you know, for purpose, like, so, you know, at our level, so they know what they're looking for rather than, oh, you can change your mind any times and we never get anywhere. But I feel like that could be done in a really structured sense. And I like that idea of giving them the chance to read mentor text and then make up their mind on what is it that I really hope to find? Or this got me thinking about something I really want to find. And I credit Shannon, because I was the same way. I was very rushed. And when she first looked at my calendar, she's like, you need to give them time to be thinking about this, you know? Uh -huh. And so, and I actually told them about three to four days in, I said, I'm sure it feels like we're like, you know, swimming in quicksand here, like it's going really slowly, but then once we get started, mm -hmm. it'll start going quite a bit faster. But I think by, by being more purposeful that way, they were able to discard topics that they realized weren't going to work or either added to or whittled away from topics right. to make it a little bit more manageable for what we're trying to accomplish. Right. So. And like at my level, they would see automatically by reading, oh, my question's been answered already. I need a deeper question. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I need a, a is, deeper yeah. focus question. Which you is, know. if you're it's teaching that at your level, I'd be, go, good for you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be so happy to know that they are writing. They are writing a paper that is introduction, several paragraphs with the animal unit we do, and a conclusion. So I think in a, the next couple of years, I hope you start to see some more of this. 
because that's something that all third grade teachers are doing that are they're doing this year. So you brought up, I think um, this the little handout about the book might offer a little bit, just some think about. Uh, Steve, you had talked about using mentor text at different stages in the writing process, and they offer a little chart here at the very beginning of, of when they would offer mentor text, because it does, it fits in any place throughout that whole writing process. Um, and at the very, the very back, they offer a few uh, sources that they would commonly go to find mentor texts. I don't know at the elementary level um, if it would be as useful, but I think at the middle school level still that there, there could be some useful things there. And as far as the questions Liz posed for her mentor text, they do also offer some examples of questions that they would encourage students to ask of mentor text that's in here as well. And one other piece is the authors of this book have they're just flat out writing classes, you know, and that's they they're not they're not having to worry about a lot of the reading standards and things like that. So they're using mentor text all the time and they do talk about uh, it's easier to use them when they're easily accessible to you, obviously. And so they talked about when you do find some and they use Google Docs to to store them, but they also try to make themselves a note of this text is good for these skills. So that you know, when students ask, I don't know how to do this, they can quickly look, find an example, and get it right in front of the students as they're drafting or as they're revising. So that, I thought, well, that's a really good idea, like just to tag something with, I could pull this out for these reasons to, to show a student. How cool to, over time, develop a library, right. a shared library. Mm -hmm. so that other they have a lot of examples in the book that you just use with the QR code. Oh, cool. So you can access them that way too. Mm -hmm. so. When I first introduced Genius Hour, I do have a non sailor and sort of names on them, but you know, some from previous years for them to just look at the images and just put it in the book. Mm -hmm. And I don't pick, always pick the best ones. I, mean, I pick a variety of them, and, they, and so they can see right away what the, the quality of them is, and you can shoot and shoot for the moon. Mm -hmm. So I think that if somebody else mentioned that, and that the students notice that, it's really helpful to not always have them be outstanding. And it gives you a mentor text to revise as well if you right. wanted to take a section of the text mm -hmm. and say, okay. Change this. How we can change this using email. I'm glad to be. It sounds like you're asking for for some kind of writing piece for Genius Hour, which that makes me so happy. I know um, there there are some teachers that go straight to like a digital piece, and so I'm happy to hear that the writing piece is still really important. Joining us today. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. I want to add, I didn't get a chance to say this, I forgot to say this at the beginning, but your um, classroom management class, I really wanted to take it. It was very evident at the end. Nobody got up when the bell rang until you wrapped it up and sort of gave the words to like set them free. Nobody moved them up. I mean, they just like didn't even hear it. They were so focused on you, even with Adam Riley over yeah, here. I know, I know. I mean, I, I thought, oh, for sure they're going to start getting out of yeah. their seats. And then no. there was nothing. It was like, yeah. it was so impressive. Yeah. Yeah, that would be hard to have that come on. It's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like signal. It's exactly <laughs> what it is. Right. That's exactly what it is. But and not only that, you're going to have to talk it over me. Yeah. Right, right. right. <laughs> Well, in this room, the 
are so many of the teachers that I admire and have learned from in the past, and I was very grateful and a little nervous that you were going to come and oh, did you? see me. So thank you for taking your time. I know it's, especially for those who are in different buildings, to try to get over here. Um, so I really appreciate you guys coming. Thanks so much. Absolutely right. It's really fun going over people's classrooms. It's more fun just observing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More of the variety. I scrambled to find decent mentor texts. I have had, in my 15 years here at Decora, many, many excellent students. But I noticed some of the things that these mentor texts were kind of modeling, I wasn't finding in my prior students' work. So I'm hoping to see, you know, whether it's mixing up um, the different places, even though I, I stress that to a certain extent, mixing up where they're giving the information or um, giving someone um, a nod within the text, you know, and here's this author, you did this, and then, you know, just the various ways to use the information. I, I'm, I'm really guessing that I'm going to see more of their own analysis and more of a variety of how they put this all together. So. And, looking, and I think that would be a good skill for them. And we've done some work with that already. I may or may not have mentioned. Um, I've had students say, no, we can't start with a quote, right? And we can't end with a quote, right? And so we've been building up to this, but I still think it's going to be valid to, um, to see how well this modeling worked for them when they're doing their own writing. So. Do you have a question as an agent? Oh, I'm, uh, I'll, no, it's, I do, but um, maybe it's. Okay. <laughs> so that takes us to round four. And during this look around, this is when you have a chance to share how you could foresee this um, having an impact in, in your own classrooms with your own students and your own um, assignments and lessons. So. If you need a couple minutes to, to jot down some ideas, we can do that. Uh, and then if you're or whenever you're ready, we can, we can jump into sharing how, how you foresee that you can maybe use something from the learning lab today. I can start. Uh, right now, we're actually, uh, students have compared two books on the same author compared and contrasted two books and right now they're in the final stages of the writing process with their script so they're going to be typing this in once it's um, published on paper they're going to be then typing it in because we want to follow the writing process and still practice that typing it into an app on their iPad so they have a script to read while they do a green screen activity part of the script that I emphasize that I want the students to do is to add quotes from the book, not at the beginning, not at the end, and not even mention, even though the, a page or a cover of the book is behind them, not right away to mention what the book is, but sort of a hook and to start telling a little bit about the plot, you know, maybe talk about a little bit about the exposition first, um, but a quote somewhere in the middle. And it got me thinking that last year when we did this unit for the first time, I never had them cite within the, the script. Granted, it's verbal when they do this in front of their peers, but I'm still looking at their published piece. And so I'm wondering, how do I do that? How do I, yeah, I don't know how what to expect from them with that. So that is, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, that progression of how we teach these skills through elementary through high school would be an interesting thing for us to put together as the LA people. Um, because we, we do genius hour, you know, eighth grade does ADHD and you know there is there is a progression that hap that is happening, but I'm not sure that we all know exactly when right. we're when we're doing what I think we do in high school and what we do. And I know I've talked to, to Miss Seaman and she focuses a lot on more of the work site page, you know, more of the references at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just started Genius Hour, what we call Genius Hour too, which is really a research project with a, with a thesis in seventh grade. And um, I do use Mr. Text from previous students. Um, but um, I think that maybe after seeing what you do, maybe I'll do um, one step at a time with each um, 
alluded to in the mentor text, you know, just emphasize, um, you know, each step along the way rather than showing them all mentor text mm -hmm. at the beginning. Um, I, I just think take a look to, to chunk it out for yeah. yeah. I'm just hoping that they have an overview of what it might look like, right? Than to just, you know, start. And I don't really know. I mean, this is seventh grade. It, it, I'm not quite sure exactly how fussy I should be with with doing citations. You know, that's something that we, I think we kind of struggle with. Like, when do we teach what? <laughs> I'm happy to let you do all of the particulars of it in high school because it is a little overwhelming in those schools. Do they use noodle tools? They must, yeah. But they can get their bibliography down, but the in-text citations. Um, I was, uh, I was intrigued by the, the, the close reading is like an analytical task of the mentor text and um, it occurred to me, I would like to do more of that for the, like it's, you did it for this real specific purpose of, of looking at, uh, I mean, for the larger purpose of developing credibility as a writer, but for the specific purpose of how do you integrate sources with your own voice and, and all of that. And it occurred to me that I would like to try that kind of close readings in a, in a digital format where uh, students would maybe in small groups have the same document and annotate it um, uh, either with a Google tool or with a hypothesis or some other digital tools so that they could see their own thinking develop as they went along. And uh, I would be curious to see how that would change valid sources so that they could write a paper with integrity and um, a paper, like you said, they themselves would be credible. 
by using credible sources. And so I can absolutely send you the calendar, but it's, um, we try to shrink it a little bit because we have other things that we need to get done. Usually I give them a day in between to hand in source cards and I have them one a day so they have to do them during their study hall. And there's some online things as well um, from the online sources, so it wasn't like they just had to do it during class. Mm -hmm. um, so they do have to have some print sources too. Um, we try to encourage that because there's so many decent ones there, but when they go to college, oftentimes they won't, they won't need to do that. So we're kind of bridging that, how much are we trying to teach them to be high school students, but then how much are we trying to prepare them for beyond, and there's some really decent sources that are online. Oh yeah. So, so we don't insist on that anymore, we used to. but. So to, to ultimately answer your question about venture text, it depends on what you're wanting to do. If you're really looking at the in, you know, the, the in-text citation part of it, I think that's more difficult than if you were just to, you know, I've got lots and lots of anthologies. I think that's where Kyra found a couple of things. If you're just looking for how someone introduces a topic. So I think keeping your goal in mind might be a little bit easier. And then you get a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> and and in, the, in the book, they they talk about approaching it in two ways. And one is looking for mentor texts that fit the genre of the exact assignment that you're hoping that they're writing. And the other is that skill-based method where so you want to focus on how somebody offers their analysis. Look at whatever you can find. They they um, definitely push the idea of finding professional writers. Um, so if if you are looking at some sort of film critique that's you know in the New York Times, but somebody really offered a piece of evidence and analysis, you look at just that paragraph of that film critique. And even though it's not that type of writing you're looking for in the class, you're looking for that skill in the writing. Uh, so they they kind of encourage that you don't have to be limited to the exact format that you're looking for. Well, I just wanted to add that it was it was good for me to I tend to tell in that show, and Liz is so good at making the students um, have ownership of their own discoveries. So that just you know, I told her I just made screencasts of everything that she talked about today, and they're going to start looking at them tomorrow, and that's fine. But it also, I think, makes more of an impact when they have to they discover some of those things. So too late for this group, but maybe next year I'll take a day like you're doing. <laughs> but that, yeah, but that, that sticks. It's fun when they discover it. So, yeah. Something interesting that I learned, or I guess didn't know could happen and maybe should happen, um, from what I know of Genius Hour and the way we design the literacy unit that we're working on, or that we just got done with, actually, or uh, the informational report one that we just got done with, you had said think and read, read and think, and then pose your guiding question. And what we do at our level is we say, what do you want your topic to be and what's your essential question? Right off the bat. And I like the idea of not, and I think we do that you know, for purpose, like, so, you know, at our level, so they know what they're looking for rather than, oh, you can change your mind many times and then we never get anywhere. But I feel like that can be done in a really structured sense. And I like that idea of giving them the chance to read Metro Text and then make up their mind on what is it that I really hope to find? Or this got me thinking about something I really want to find. And I credit Shannon, because I was the same way. I was very rushed. And when she first looked at my calendar, she's like, you need to give them time to be thinking about this, you know? Yeah. And so, and I actually told them about three to four days in, I said, I'm sure it feels like we're like, you know, swimming in quicksand here, like it's going really slowly, but then once we get started, it'll start going quite a bit faster. But I think by, by being more purposeful that way, they were able to discard topics that they realized weren't going to work, or, either added to or whittled away from topics right. to make it a little bit more manageable for what we're trying to accomplish. Right. So. And like, I 
at my level, they would see automatically by reading, oh, my question's been answered already. I need a deeper question. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I need a, a She's, deeper focused yeah. question. Which is, yeah. if you're teaching that at your level, I'd be, go, good for you, girl. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be so happy to know that they are writing. They are writing a paper that is an introduction, several paragraphs with the animal unit awesome. we do, and a conclusion. So I think in a, the next couple of years, I hope you start to see some more of this. Because that's something that all third grade teachers are doing, or they're doing this year. So. you brought up, I think um, this the little handout about the book might offer a little bit, just some think about. Uh, Steve, you had talked about using mentor texts at different stages in the writing process, and they offer a little chart here at the very beginning of, of when they would offer mentor text, because it does, it fits in any place throughout that whole writing process. Um, and at the very, the very back, they offer a few uh, sources that they would commonly go to find mentor texts. I don't know at the elementary level um, if it would be as useful, but I think at the middle school level still that there, there could be some useful things there. And as far as the questions Liz posed for her mentor text, they do also offer some examples of questions that they would encourage students to ask of mentor text that's in here as well. And one other piece is the authors of this book have they're just flat out writing classes, you know, and that's they they're not they're not having to worry about a lot of the reading standards and things like that. So they're using mentor texts all the time and they do talk about uh, it's easier to use them when they're easily accessible to you, obviously. And so they talked about when you do find some and they use Google Docs to to store them, but they also try to make themselves a note of this text is good for these skills. Mm -hmm. So that you know, when students ask, I don't know how to do this, they can quickly look, find an example, and get it right in front of the students as they're drafting or as they're revising. So that, I thought, well, that's a really good idea, like just to tag something with, I could pull this out for these reasons to, to show a student. How cool to, over time, develop a library, right. a shared library. Mm -hmm. so they have a lot of examples in the book that you just use with the QR code. Oh, cool. So you can access them that way, too. So. When I first introduced Genius Hour, I do have a non sailor and students names on them. But, you know, some from previous years for them to just look at the game they just put the in the book. And I don't pick, always pick the best ones. I, mean, I pick a variety of them, and they end so they can see right away what the, the quality of them is and you can shoot, and shoot for the moon. Mm -hmm. So I think that somebody else mentioned that to that the students notice that it would be helpful to not always have them be outstanding. And it gives you a mentor text to revise as well if you wanted to take a section of the text mm -hmm. and say, okay, let's change this, how we can change this using it sounds like you're asking for for some kind of writing piece for Genius Hour, which that makes me so happy. I know um, there there are some teachers that go straight to like a digital piece, and so I'm happy to hear that the writing piece is still really important. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much.